One, two, three, four, five.
Good morning. I am Reverend Dr. Mark Boyer, the minister here at First Parish Church Congregational in beautiful Manchester-by-the-Sea, Massachusetts. And I welcome you here to this time of worship, this time of remembrance and reflection and recommitment to God and God's ways on this second Sunday of the Easter season. First Parish Church Congregational, the congregational part of our name signifying our long-standing history and tradition within Christianity of democratic governance and the full equality of all members of the spiritual community to participate in its life and work. Which means that I welcome you here this morning to this place where no matter who you are or where you are on your life or spiritual journey, you are fully welcome. As I mentioned in some of our communications over the last week or two, beginning this Sunday and for the next two Sundays, the uh, members of our music leadership team are going to be rotating out, taking a well-deserved Sunday off. First up this Sunday is Dr. Herman Weiss, but have no fear, as you heard during the prelude, we are in extremely good hands today. Once again, we are blessed with the enormously talented pianist and good friend of First Parish, Dr. Bonnie Anderson. So welcome again, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. So with all of that, I now invite you to join in the singing of this morning's opening hymn, Joy Dawned Again on Easter Day, the words to which are printed in your online bulletin. I now invite you to also join with us in this morning's opening prayer, the words to which are also printed in your online bulletin. At that first Easter, O oh God, you raised Jesus as you promised to raise us. But as your Easter people, you also call us to rise now. You call us to rise and go toward places we have never been and may not want to go into lives saddened, struggling, and suffering. You call us to go toward those who are strangers to us and those we are estranged from. You call us to rise and go toward those we love, those who are unloved, and those we find unlovable. Help us to rise and go, Holy One. 
And when we get there, help us to listen carefully, think openly, forgive graciously, and love unconditionally. The way Jesus did. The way Jesus calls us to. And so we rise this morning and say to you now the words the risen Jesus gave us. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy thy name. name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come. come. Thy Thy will will be done done on on earth earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give Give us this this day day our daily daily bread. bread. And forgive forgive us our our trespasses, trespasses, as as we we forgive forgive those who trespass trespass against against us. And lead us not not into temptation, temptation, but deliver deliver us from from evil. evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Paul. So as we come to this morning's time of prayer, I ask you to continue to hold in your hearts and minds and spirits all health care workers and scientists, all first responders, all those who continue to work diligently to both care for those who suffer from COVID-19 and now continue to get vaccinations in people's arms throughout the country. And again, on that note, please get vaccinated. When you get the chance, do it as soon as possible. Again, not just for your sake, but for all of our sake in that understanding of the idea of covenant in the Christian spiritual tradition. Also ask you to hold in your hearts and minds and spirits all of the uh, the deacons and lay leaders and members of the worship team as we continue to plan and uh, take the steps necessary for us to begin regathering for this worship time in person on Sunday, May 2nd. Again, there are a number of things still to take care of, but we are coming along nicely and expect that we will see people in here for the first time, well, people other than us, of course, for the first time in over a year on May 2nd. I ask you to hold in your hearts and minds and spirits Annie Greenleaf. Annie is having a heart valve replacement procedure tomorrow. And then also, we have a number of birthdays this week. So I ask you to hold in your hearts and minds and spirits and celebrate with these folks as their birthdays approach this week. Lely Smith, our good friend Lely Smith. Lely's birthday is today. And so we send birthday blessings out to Lely on this occasion. This coming Thursday is Ben Shrimpton's birthday, and so we remember that and we send birthday wishes to Ben as well. And then this coming Friday, uh, Annie Greenleaf's birthday is this coming Friday, so this is quite, uh, quite a week for Annie, so we will hold her in, in double the, the prayers this week. And lastly, also on Friday, we send birthday blessings to Mary Ann Round. And so with all of that, I now welcome you to share any other joys or concerns, any other prayer intentions that you might have. Share them with those who you may be with at this time, or simply offer them up to our God in the silence of your hearts and minds and spirits over the next few moments. I invite you to join me in prayer. 
risen Jesus live in our lives today? Here are our faces. May we see you in others and others see you in them. Here are our mouths. May we speak your truth, love, compassion, and kindness through them. Here are our ears. May we listen deeply with them to those who see the world differently. Here are our hearts. May we open them to you and to those in need. Here are our hands. May we use them to serve you and stay with it when they feel weak. Here are our arms. May we use them to gather others in instead of pushing them away. And here are our feet, risen Jesus. May they carry us on the path to the fullness of life that you want for us and all people. Amen. Thank you, Bonnie. Now I invite you to share with me these words from the first chapter of the first letter of John in the New Testament. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father 
and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So something a little different today, something that uh, I have been doing for, oh, 15 or 16 years now. Uh, at least twice a year, usually the Sunday after Christmas and the Sunday after Easter, and then uh, one or two other times during the year. Uh, it's a segment that we call Ask the Minister. I have not done this before uh, here. This will be the first time here at First Parish, but uh, far from the last one, I hope. And so what we have done is we, uh, we asked for members of our spiritual community to submit questions ahead of time. Back when we are uh, regathered in person, that won't be as necessary. We'll just field them right on that day. But we got a number of questions sent in over the past week from, uh, from you folks. And uh, we're going to try to answer as many of those as possible. Just a couple of quick caveats. In some instances, it may not be possible to give as comprehensive an answer to the question as I'd like, because having glanced kind of quickly at some of them, that might require a full semester of seminary. Uh, but we're going to give it a shot, at least a little bit. Uh, and then the second caveat is in keeping with our tradition, uh, the congregational tradition, the tradition within the United Church of Christ of freedom of conscience and the understanding that we don't have all the answers. Okay. A legitimate answer for me, it's okay if I say, I don't know. Might happen. Just want to get that out there. All right, so here we go. The first question. On Good Friday, we commemorate Jesus being beaten and painfully put to death by crucifixion. What's so good about that? It's an important question. And I want to, I'll answer again, you know, as concisely as I can on two levels, both uh, linguistically and theologically. Linguistically, at the time of, you know, the writing of the, the biblical literature, Hebrew scriptures all the way through the end of the New Testament, but particularly around uh, the time of Jesus's life and death. The word good, as it is used in the, in the Bible, in the scriptures, is more often than not, not good as in the way we normally think of that, pleasant or you know, desirable. The word good in the Bible is often synonymous with, with the idea of holy. Okay, so think of it that way. Uh, good Friday as in holy. Holy Friday, and in, in some cultures and in some parts of the world historically in Christianity, it has been called things like Holy Friday instead. So it puts a little bit different uh, context on it. And then theologically, uh, the, the primary reason why it's called Good Friday is essentially the idea that no cross, no resurrection. Okay, it is it is good in the sense of understanding where it leads, not in the sense of good in the moment in terms of what is happening. 
but what its result turns out to be. And so that is why the church has referred to it for centuries as Good Friday, those two particular reasons, the linguistic one and the theological one. All right, next one. I had always thought that the Gospels were written by the person whose name is on them. Is that the case? And if not, what's the story? All right, well, the story is this. All four Gospels were written several decades after Jesus' death, ranging from 40 to approximately 70 years after Jesus' death. The names that we have on them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the tradition, the longstanding traditional understanding has been, you know, Matthew and John were two of the disciples. Uh, Mark was someone who would become an associate of Peter. And then Luke uh, has been considered to be a companion and associate of Paul, the early Christian leader who spreads Christian, the, the message of Jesus and the cross and the resurrection into Greek-speaking Gentile territories. Okay? But those are, those are, what are examples of what scholars call pseudo-epigraphy. They are essentially names put on the documents. The documents, the Gospels were written by anonymous authors. We do not know who wrote them. The authors are anonymous. And those names were put on those Gospels as this uh, form of what I just referred to, the pseudo-epigraphy, which is the idea of putting the name of someone known or someone with some type of reputation onto a document. And it happened frequently in the ancient world uh, for two reasons. Okay? One was as a form of honor, and the other was simply that if you put somebody well-known, if you put their name on the document, you were much more likely to have it get attention than if you put your own name on it when you didn't have that kind of name uh, and reputation. So, and then the other thing, the other reason I say that the writers are anonymous and they were, they were not these people who were either disciples or uh, people who would have, would have known Jesus or been close companions uh, is, is that all four Gospels are written in Greek. The entire New Testament is written in Greek. None of Jesus' closest followers would have spoken Greek. They either spoke Hebrew or an ancient dialect known as Aramaic. So again, they were not Greek speakers, and the documents are written in Greek. So that's, again, that's sort of a Cliff's Notes version of you know, whose names are on the Gospels, why they are on there, but the fact of the matter is, is the, the writers of the Gospels are anonymous to us. Okay. All right. Resurrection, I'm sorry, reincarnation. Reincarnation is a belief held by many, including some Christians. Is there any biblical basis for this concept? Uh, in a word, no. No, there really is no biblical basis for the idea of reincarnation that we see in, uh, in other spiritual paths. We have resurrection in the Christian spiritual tradition. And they are different. They are not the same. A reincarnation is essentially about rebirth. The rebirth of someone's, uh, of someone's soul into another body after the death of the previous body. A process that can go on indefinitely. If until a person, if they do, reaches this stage of enlightenment. Okay. Resurrection is a very different thing. As we talked about last Sunday, resurrection, again, as, as Paul understood it, and he was the first, really, first Christian leader to write about resurrection. It's not rebirth, it is transformation. It is the transformation of the physical body into a spiritual body. And again, as I mentioned last Sunday, you know, I don't know what that looks like, sounds like. We don't know what that looks like, sounds like. But they are not the same. Okay? One is about rebirth. One is about 
transformation. So, and, so no, there is no biblical basis uh, for the idea of reincarnation. How are Jesus' being raised on Easter and Jesus raising Lazarus from death in John's gospel the same or different? The two acts are different, not the same thing. Again, as we just mentioned, Jesus being raised by God, what we refer to as resurrection, is a form of, is, is some type of transformation of the physical body into some type of spiritual body. What Jesus does with Lazarus in John's gospel, and it's the only gospel of the four in which that story occurs, is a, is a physical raising from a state of death. It's essentially resuscitation. A dead body is resuscitated once again into the same physical life. Okay. Lazarus will die again and die for good the second time. Okay. They're not the same. The importance of that act, okay, besides showing, besides it being a demonstration of Jesus' power, the significance of that act and the reason that it's only in John's gospel is that for John, that act is what precipitates the path to the cross. It's that act. In the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it is Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem and then his subsequent uh, demonstration, shall we call it, in the temple where he disrupts the temple, the turning over of the tables, that, that incident. That is the incident that basically precipitates the rest of what happens during what we call Holy Week, but not in John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, what pre precipitates this need for the legal and religious authorities to have Jesus done away with is the, is the resuscitation, the bringing back to life of Lazarus. That simply is just too much of a threat for the powers that be. So that's the difference between the two. All right, this one I'm gonna I'm gonna read this one from the from the email. Beginning in the 1970s, many churches and seminaries became very aware of the need for more inclusive language in our religious language. It seems that some people are aware of how our words come across to non-church people. And it turns them off when people picture God as an old man on a throne. Others think that the language of the Bible is already inclusive, but gets translated with lack of sensitivity to the whole issue. Language in prayers, hymns, and even choice of which Bible translation we use are very important to many Christians. We love the expressions of our childhood piety, but want to be in tune with scripture in contemporary understandings. <clears throat> How should we think about these concerns? All right, I would say uh, three ways, uh, biblically, theologically, and practically, okay? Uh, first off, from a biblical perspective. While the masculine type of language and references to God tend to predominate, it's not exclusive. There are a number of places in the Bible where there are references to God that take on a more feminine perspective. God, uh, God portrayed as, uh, as mother. Okay. Uh, wisdom. Wisdom is another example. Wisdom in the Hebrew scriptures particularly is considered to be one of the facets of God, one of the sides of God's personality, and wisdom far more often than not in the Hebrew scriptures uh, is portrayed uh, in the feminine. Okay, so that's one way. We do need to, we need to open up our, our awareness of the fact that the biblical language is, is, not just, uh, is not just masculine, but does include the feminine as well. Theologically, you know, uh, at le again, at least for me, the issue is, 
uh, and, and it's, it's a cliche, I'm not crazy about the cliche, but I think it does apply, is, is our being careful not to put God in a box. <clears throat> okay. Theologians talk about two primary aspects of God's nature. God as transcendent and God as imminent. Uh, God as imminent means the you know, God who is with us, you know, who is present with us, who is involved in our uh, our lives and our world. The transcendent God, that other dimension of God, transcendent means above and beyond. This is the God of the first creation story, the God who creates, who speaks, and things come into being. Okay. I think if we, if we narrow our language, if we insist that we can only talk about God in the masculine or only talk about God in a particular way. <clears throat> we are limiting that transcendent aspect, that God is above and beyond us in the end. And so I think it's, I think it's always best to sort of keep an open mind and an open heart and an open spirit about the ways that we refer to God and the language that we use in terms of the Bible translation, in terms of the, the hymns that we sing. It doesn't mean throw out everything that came before. I think there needs to be a respect for that. But there needs to be at least a broadening of the tools that we use. And also communication about the fact that, that this is the way it has been historically, or, or understanding the, the multi-dimensional way in which the Bible can refer to God, those types of things. Okay. And then lastly, from a, a practical perspective, I think it is vital for the church to, to speak to people where they are. And things change. You know, the only, the only constant in the universe, I think, is, is change. And so we need to always have that in mind. If we are concerned about maintaining our tradition, passing on this vital, essential, spiritual message to others after us. We need to be able to speak to them where they are okay? and not just where we want them to be. And so that necessitates, again, broadening our perspective and being able to adjust our language and, and certain traditions as the need arises. You don't, it doesn't, you don't throw out the basics. The essentials are still the same. The life and the teachings and the message and the love and the mercy and forgiveness and compassion that Jesus embodied for us. That's what matters most. That's the heart of it. And I think a lot of the rest of it is, you know, is sort of window dressing that, that it's okay for us to change and adapt. What does the Bible tell us about the relative importance of obedience versus atonement? OK, next question. Just kidding. Obedience and atonement, they are related. Uh, in terms of talking about their relative importance, it's, it's, that's kind of a hard one. But I, I guess, in a sense, Obedience is the heart of the matter in terms of the relationship between the two. Atonement is only necessary when there is lack of obedience. So obedience has to come first. Okay? Uh, and, and atonement, okay, that's, a, that's an important word in Christian theology. Okay, this idea of atonement. Atonement means to uh, to make amends, or in the language of the Bible, to make amends for our trespasses, our sins, um, or to turn away from sin after we have gone down the wrong path. That's atonement. Uh, you know, one of my theology professors in seminary, you know, used to break the word down, at one meant. And that that was the meaning of atonement. It was to get us back to being at one 
with God. So atonement is vital because we are all guilty of, of sin at times. But again, there's no need for atonement without obedience. And so obedience is the, is the foundational aspect of that comparison. You regularly refer to the idea of covenant. What do you mean by that? Again, in the language of the Bible, covenant is based on uh, an ancient arrangement, an arrangement in the ancient world, a very common one, between uh, either a ruler and people or a landowner and people. And, and the word covenant basically means contract. It was a contract between that ruler or that leader and those people that the ruler or leader would, would do this, and in return, the people would do that. So that idea became part of the, the Judeo-Christian spiritual tradition in the sense of God making covenants with people from the beginning of the Bible throughout. God makes a covenant with Adam and Eve. This is... You know, this is all available to you, to use. You know, but in return, you must be, and we'll go back to the last question, you need to be obedient. You need to follow my rules. God makes a covenant with, uh, with Noah, the flood story. Okay? After the flood, God promises to never destroy humanity again. God makes a covenant with Abraham. You are going to be the descendant of a people who will be more numerous than the grains of sand. Okay? All throughout the Bible, God is making covenant. Covenant with individuals, and then a covenant with the Israelites. I will be your God, and you will be my people, God says in the book of Exodus. Okay? And then, lastly, we get to the Gospels in the New Testament where for those of us in the Christian spiritual tradition, that covenant becomes fulfilled in Jesus. But covenant exists on more than one level. For us, again, in our, in our tradition, covenant is about the covenant between, between God and us, but then also because of that covenant, we are now called to be in covenant with each other both on an individual basis and as members of both a singular spiritual community like this one and then the larger Christian community as well. Okay, we are called into this idea of covenant, sacred promise. Okay, for us, in relation to others, it is that we will be each other's people. We will care for each other in, in the way that Jesus taught and showed us. It, again, it, it is why I make that mention about getting vaccinated as an understanding of covenant, as a practice of covenant. Because in the Christian spiritual tradition, what happens to one happens to all of us. So that's covenant. How are we to understand the elements of communion and what our partaking of them mean? Perfect question for a communion Sunday. Uh, communion is, uh, is kind of like resurrection. There has never been one singular understanding throughout Christianity of what communion is about. Okay. Uh, and again, this is a kind of a, a Cliff's Notes version, because this is a, you know, a, a full answer to this would take us quite a while. But essentially, there are three ways in which communion has been understood. Okay, first, there is this idea of transubstantiation. And that is most closely associated with Catholicism. 
Transubstantiation says that in the sacrament of communion, through the words of the priest, the elements, the host and the wine, are literally transformed into the body and blood of Christ. It is, it is understood as, a, as an intimate, as intimate as possible, a partaking, a bringing of Jesus into our own bodies. Okay. So that's, uh, that's transubstantiation. Then there's something called consubstantiation, which has most uh, closely been associated with the Lutheran, uh, the Lutheran denomination. And consubstantiation says that the real presence of Jesus' body and blood is in the communion elements. Not the same, not quite the same as transubstantiation, the literal body and blood, but the, but the real presence of Jesus' body and blood are alongside the communion elements. And then there is the understanding that is more commonly associated with you know, churches in, in our tradition, in the congregational tradition, the United Church of Christ tradition. Uh, and that is the idea of communion as a memorial. An understanding that when we celebrate communion, we are immersing ourselves once again in the night of the Last Supper. And Jesus' call to his disciples to us, that whenever we do this, to do it in remembrance of me, as he says on that night. Okay. And to remember the great commandment, to love one another as I have loved you. So those are the, the three ways in which, uh, in which the communion elements are most commonly understood. Uh, within Christianity. Now, the thing is, of course, in keeping with our tradition and the idea of freedom of conscience, every member, every member of our spiritual community is free to decide for themselves what those communion elements mean to them. I have had uh, members in previous churches who, uh, who firmly believe that, you know, I was performing the, the words that, uh, that produce transubstantiation. Others saw it as consubstantiation. The majority saw it as uh, in the sense of memorial. But again, in our tradition, every member is free to decide for themselves what those elements mean for them. Okay. All right, two more. Uh, and they, they both have to do with uh, our Maundy Thursday uh, commemoration, where we focused on uh, the dream that Pilate had in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, the first is, what was, Pilate's, what was Pilate believed to have been like? And why did the Gospels downplay his role in Jesus' death? What historical records there are about Pilate, suggests that he was not a particularly nice guy. Uh, Pilate is considered to have been uh, a very ruthless, brutal governor of the territory of Judea and the city of Jerusalem. Uh, you know, again, it is why uh, when we portrayed him on that night, we portrayed him as someone who, who really didn't think twice to have Jesus crucified. Because that is what was done. That is what was done all the time to people who were considered to be threats to Roman authority. And Pilate was simply of that kind of vein, a very brutal type of ruler from the time he came to Judea to the time that he left. As for the other part, why is that downplayed in the Gospels? And it is. And it is. Two reasons. One of them not particularly admirable, the other certainly understandable, at least. 
The first reason, the one that is not particularly admirable, is that by downplaying Pilate's role, made it possible to upplay the role of the Jewish people. And that's a problem that we have with the Gospels. And we've talked about this before, is that going back to one of the earlier questions today, the Gospels were written several decades after Jesus' death. And in that time, there was some conflict. There was conflict between the early Christian communities and the larger Jewish communities. A conflict which, at least for uh, the early Jewish Christians, the, the Christians who, uh, who, the community that developed in and around Jerusalem after Jesus' death, it would get to a point where it would, it would cause the final separation of those two communities. The conflict represented in those gospel stories around Jesus' crucifixion are probably more a reflection of that conflict in that time than the reality of what happened with Jesus' death. Historians believe that the reality of what happened with Jesus' death has a lot more to do with the Roman authorities and their unwillingness to allow any type of unrest or any possible uprising. They were constantly putting uprisings down. The Jewish people were constantly rising up to try to drive the Romans out, understandably. And finally, it would come to a head. About 40 years after Jesus' death, in 70 CE, the Romans would have enough. And they would level Jerusalem and the second temple. Mark's gospel, the first of the four gospels written, is written around that time. And it reflects that, reflects that history. So that's the not so admirable reason why Pilate's role is downplayed. The other reason, the more understandable one, is again, Christianity would, would spread. It would leave its origins in, in Judea and Jerusalem, and it would spread into Greek-speaking Gentile territories of the Roman Empire. If you are a fledgling spiritual tradition, and you are trying to not just grow but survive, you are going to be very careful about the language that you use related to the people who rule the region of the world that you are trying to grow in. So it was a very, a very pragmatic reason in that sense as to why Pilate's role is downplayed. Okay. All right, and then the last one. On Monday Thursday, you did a reflection based on the dream that Pilate's wife had. But nowhere is her name mentioned. Do we know what it was? Yes, we do. Pilate's wife's name was Co. Co Pilate. <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw that one in. That one, that's mine. Thought we'd end on a little silliness. So those are what we have. Those were just those were great questions. So I really look forward to the next time that we do this, especially since we will do it uh, face to face. So with that. And since we just recently talked about the sacrament of communion, we will proceed to that. As we gather, at this table, this communion table, we recall the stories of our spiritual tradition, the stories of covenant, God's covenant with Adam and Eve, God's covenant with Noah, God's covenant with Abraham, God's covenant with our ancient Israelite spiritual ancestors. And then, of course, God's covenant with us, God's covenant with us through Jesus, through the life and teachings and death and resurrection of our brother and teacher and Lord Jesus. The one who 
on the night before his earthly life would end, gathered those closest to him. And on that night, as he had them with him, he would take bread, would give God thanks for it. He would break that bread and he would pass it among them and say, take this and eat it. And whenever you do this from now on, do it in my memory. And then Jesus took a cup, gave God thanks for that, passed that cup among those with him and said, take this and drink from it. And whenever you do this from now on, do it also in my memory. And so we ask our gracious, loving, covenanting God to bless this bread and this juice. We ask God to send the Holy Spirit upon it and upon us so that we might do God's work in God's world for the sake of God's people. And so, my friends, these are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. I now invite you to share those.
Thank you, Rebecca. I'd like to once again thank you for joining us here at First Parish this morning for this time of remembrance and reflection and recommitment to God and God's ways as embodied for us in the life and death and resurrection of our brother and teacher and Lord Jesus. I also want to thank the members of our worship team, our musical leaders, our guest, Dr. Bonnie Anderson. Thanks again, Bonnie, for being with us. Rebecca Shrimpton and Paul Knox, and our technical leaders, Richard Smith and Paul Godonis and Mark Heslop and Cindy Boyer for their efforts in bringing this time to you this morning. I also hope that if you have some time, you'll stay for our virtual friendship time in just a few moments, the directions to which are in your online bulletin. So now, my friends, it is time for us to leave this sacred space and go out into the world ready and willing to rise up to meet God's call for our lives, to rise up and bring the light of Easter into the world, into a world that so badly needs to rise up and become all that God created it to be. And for that opportunity, that opportunity to be bearers of light into the world, we say thanks be to God and amen. God in my hand and in my understanding God in my eyes and in my Thank mm-hmm. you.